Today in Across the Fence, two new books by UVM professor. One takes readers overseas, while the other goes behind bars. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Silva, in for Judy Simpson. I thought it was appropriate, since we're talking today about books, to open with a quote from St. Augustine. The world is a book, and those who do not travel read only one page. Books are a great way to travel from the comfort of your favorite chair, but there's nothing wrong with going out, getting lost, or as you'll see shortly, paying a visit to a place you've only seen on the big screen. Our guide today is professor from the Department of English at the University of Vermont, Tony Magistrelli. His collection of poems is called Dialogues Among Lost Tourists, and he has another book he co-authored with Mara Grady, The Shawshank Experience, Tracking the World's Favorite Movie. Welcome back. Thank you, pleasure to be back. A pleasure to have you. Uh, before we talk a little bit about the books, what kind of traveler are you? Are you a, are you a f person who follows maps or do you just wander? I'm a wanderer. Wanderer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's part of the reason why I named this new book uh, Dialogues Among Lost Tourists, because I really believe that getting lost in a strange place mm -hmm. is a great way to discover new things. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this collection come about? Well, it was a process. Uh, this is probably 10 years of poems mm -hmm. that have been published. Some of them have been published in magazines, but this is the first time they've all been brought together in the same place. And it's the, the, the book itself is divided into three sections. Mm -hmm. One deals with lost fathers. The other one deals with uh, lost tourists, <laughs> which, is, which are poems that are about travel. Mm -hmm. And the, the last one deals with dialogues of paint and marble. Mm -hmm. In this uh, search for lost things, how old is the oldest poem? God, I'm tempted to say about 20 years old. Mm. Yeah. So you've been working on this for a while. It's been it's been in process for a while, yeah. but, but most of the poems are new. Mm. Um, share one of your poems with us. We don't really do sure. poetry readings on Across the Fence, but we'll we'll break some barriers here. Okay. What are you going to read? Well, I, I thought there were a lot of choices, and it was difficult for me to just finally decide on this one. But I thought this would be appropriate because it's so relevant to where we are on the calendar right now. Excellent. Uh, and it's called The Last Day of August. It is as if summer has waited for some painter or poet to render it, held its heavily perfumed breath for vacations to end and the last child to trudge back to school before releasing this white gift from its private stock, so sun-dappled and still, even my neighbor's obtrusive lawnmower is caught napping. Let me not waste this day, bemoaning summer's impending loss. On, on that, we've had quite enough poems and paintings, especially since remembering summer is never just about one summer, but many, perhaps all of them conjoined in conflated time, like days recollected from childhood. Let us recognize instead this passing in the quiet solemnity of the now as it wanders across this clear sky and landscape, this day apparently devoid of anyone's notice, and hope that there is still more bounty, more juice left for us to squeeze and taste as the fruits of summer, its melons and berries, anticipate the harvest to come. Oh, very good. Uh, sort of a prayer, almost. A yeah. prayer for the end of summer. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. It's, 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 a, it's a cusp poem, isn't it? It's on the edge of summer and fall. Right. So that's why I thought, nice thing to read to your audience today. Well, thank you very much. Is writing poems a way for you to process where you've been? Um, it is. It's a way to process where I've been, but it's also a way to understand where I've been. Mm. Uh, because a lot of times I, you don't really understand the experience that you've had, even the smallest experiences that you've had, until you can write about them. Um, writing brings it together. Is it different writing in a journal and saying, I went here, I did this, as opposed to then trying to form a poem and make some sort of artistic statement out of it? Yeah, I think there's a chasm between <laughs> the kind of writing that you say, this is where I've been, this is what I did today, and what happens when you write a poem. Because one is simply a, a log, a, a recognition of the places and mm -hmm. times and experiences. The other one is, the, the, the poem is something that takes those moments and turns them into art. Mm. And that's why that whole process thing, you're saying why it took you, you know, sometimes 20 years, 10 years, or even, you know, a month, a few months, to, it takes time to process and figure all that stuff out. It also takes time to write. I mean, you know, <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're trying to write a poem, a lot of times it goes through 
uh, revisions mm. and and what it looks like in its first draft is not at all what it looks like when it finally comes out in print. Right. One of the places you visited stateside is the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio. What brought you there? Well, I've always been a fan of the Shawshank Redemption, the film, mm -hmm. but this happened to be its 20th anniversary since its theatrical release. And um, the person who actually co-wrote this book with me was a student of mine okay. 25 years ago. And uh, she decided what better person to have come but somebody who wrote the book on Stephen King's film adaptations mm -hmm. to do the keynote. So I did that. I, I said, oh, this is going to be wonderful. I'll get to see the Ohio State Reformatory, which is, of course, the setting for the Shawshank Redemption. Right. And I'll pick up a check and everybody <laughs> wins. You know, but it turned out to be much more than that. It turned out finally to be a poem. Finally to be a poem. I'm, I'll, I'll ask you that in a, in, in a little bit. Uh, what is this place like? Is it, if, is it worth the trip? I've, I've, I've been told this is not sort of in near downtown, <laughs> you know, near some sort of downtown Mecca in Ohio. Well, it, it's in Mansfield, Ohio, mm -hmm. and Mansfield is located approximately midway between Cleveland and Columbus. Okay. So it's on nobody's route. Okay. But, it, it, and Mansfield is a place that looks like it's on nobody's route. It's mm -hmm. down on its luck. Uh, every third building is hollowed out, okay. windows broken, empty warehouses. You're not selling this here. <laughs> well, it, it's, not a it's not a place you go to visit unless you love this film. Okay. If you love this film, everything's there. Mm -hmm. the, the prison where it was filmed, uh, the places that became part of the became part of the film. I mean, this is it, it truly is a journey uh, to I, I think um, the center of this film. Mm. I was doing some research, and this is not just sort of for fun. People have their weddings there. They hold receptions there. Uh, this is a big deal. This is a a meeting place for. Pilgrims, it's almost a religious yeah. site. Well, you know, the, the prison was scheduled to be demolished in 1990, I think it was 1990, mm -hmm. and when Darabont, the, the man who directed the, the film yeah. and wrote the screenplay, when his crew found it, they said this was perfect because, of course, it was uninhabited, but it, was all, it also had all of the trappings that they wanted for, to, to mm -hmm. pull this film off. Well, after this film became popular in 1994, and now, of course, as I think many of your your uh, audience knows, has become um, the number one film of all time, right. according to the Internet Movie Database, at right, least, right. and according to a lot of fans, people, fans, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, once that became, once it became that famous, the community began to recognize. My God, we've got something really mm. important here. Mm. And um, the prison began to grow on not only the community, but of course, a kind of international community right. Right. That, that came to, that came to do to do a pilgrimage here, right, right, right. to do homage. Uh, it, as a as a writer of a of a book, you need to be a little analytical uh, and, and and sort of dispassionate. Are you dispassionate when you go there? Are you like, no, I'm just here to sort of you know be an English professor and explain this to you? Or do you are you a fan at all? I, I'm both. Both. I'm okay. really both. When I when I went to that prison, I went there to discover what it was about this place mm -hmm. that had captivated me in so for so many years. I've been a fan of this film since it first came out. I've taught it at least 25 times in the last uh, in the last 20 years at least. So I wanted I wanted to go there and I wanted to indulge the whole concept of fandom, right. which is part of what this book's about. This right. book is also a, about the issue of what happens when fans discover a place that's still there that brings them back to a film or a, a piece of art that they recognize. Mm -hmm. But I was also a scholar. Right. I was also looking at this thing as a film critic, as a film scholar, and examining what it was about Shawshank Redemption that was so important um, to the pantheon of American cinema. So what's the, what inspired is the devotion? What brings it about? What is it? What's the what's in the DNA of this movie that brings out such devotion? Uh, well, um, there are a lot of ways to talk about that. Let me go right to the heart of it. It it can make men cry, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and there are not many films that can do that. Okay. Okay.
Okay. Cornfields in Iowa and prisons in Ohio. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Gotcha. There's something about the Midwest, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the sort of yeah. elephant in the room here is Stephen King, who wrote the book that uh, the Shawshank Redemption is based on. Uh, back in 82, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Is he even a factor in the Ohio State Reformatory and what's going on there? Is, is, are, are fans of the movie fans of the movie and the book can kind of, it's, it's its own thing? Well, I think, I think you've got a dual representation here. Okay. I mean, people are drawn to this film because Stephen King wrote the novel that it was based on. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, the novel's only about 100 pages long. Mm. So what the what Darabont did in writing the screenplay to this was to really elaborate on King's novel. Uh, there are many, many moments, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, right. there are many, many moments when this film um, extrapolates beyond King's novel. Mm. Uh, and of course, one of, the, one of the most famous scenes is the, the Mozart uh, aria that right. takes place you know, over, the, over the prison yard where right. they play the marriage of Figaro. Mm -hmm. That is not in the film, or that's in the not book. in King's novel at right. all. Right, do you, do, are, are people that you meet there, your, your fellow pig, pilgrims, your fellow visitors, have they read the book? Are they there because they've read the book, or are they there because you know they've seen the movie? Well, this is that dual representation. Right, right. You know, the Ohio State Reformatory gets 110,000 visitors every year. Hmm. Part of the reason, a huge part of the reason for that, is because of the film and the book. Right. The other part is because of prison tourism. The Ohio State Reformatory is now on the same map with the Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia and Alcatraz out That's in it. California. Right. It it. It, it has, in some way, struck a chord with people who want to go to visit prisons. prisons. <laughs> and that's a whole different discussion. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> yeah. um, as opposed to, I, I won't ask you to remember how many times you read the book versus seen the movie. Is, this, it, it, is that devotion, that love for the thing, because they love it for what it is, or because it's one of those movies where you see something new every time? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think you do see something new every time mm -hmm. because it is a complex and, and deeply a meaningful film. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would, I would say that part of it is because it's, a good, it's just a good story. Just a good story. It's just a good story. I mean, I, I defy anyone who's doing channel surfing and they run on, and they come on the Shawshank Redemption. Mm -hmm. I defy anyone to change the channel, mm -hmm. you know, after two or three minutes of watching it. You mm -hmm. just get sucked into it. And we've talked about this before. And one of the things that's fascinating about it is it was a hit on you know, basic cable. So you had to watch commercials in between. This wasn't like a, a big DVD hit. So it is sort of when you're channel surfing, you'll sit through the commercials. Yeah to watch The Shawshank Redemption? Well, it, it, it's always on television. Right. You know, right. You, you can find it almost every couple of months, sure. again, on television. But it, it, it's got an interesting history in terms of its, uh, in terms of its audience. Mm. Um, it began in 1994 as a film that, that did not make enough money. It right. really, it started off badly Failure. in terms of box office, yeah. but it caught fire with, uh, with DVD, uh, not DVDs. Um, uh, cable, cable television. Not, no, not no? cable either. Uh, uh, VHS. Oh, sorry, VHS. It, it, it began with Lest VHS <laughs> and, and, and word of mouth. Okay. And that's what, that's what uh, made this film take off. Mm. In 1995, it was the number one requested VHS uh, <laughs> recording. 95, that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't so long ago, about 22 years by my reckoning. Yeah, but the technology <laughs> changes right. in 22 years. That's right. Um, just a, about a minute left. Uh, when students, do all your students who you teach encounter, have they already seen it? Is it, is it a is it fait accompli that they've already seen it? They haven't, but their fathers have. Okay. <laughs> very good. Very <laughs> and good. I always tell them, you know, make sure before we teach, before I teach the film, I say, make sure you write home or call your father, text your father, <laughs> and tell him you've got Shawshank this week, and, and it'll break his heart. Okay. <laughs> no one was texting their dad back in 1995. They weren't. Um, uh, have you written a poem, an ode, a, a dirty limerick, perhaps, to uh, Shawshank? No. All right. Well, when you do, no. we'll, uh, we'll check back in with you. Tony, thank you very much. Yeah. I want to thank everyone here at WCAX for making this program possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.